12 certified BG fitters. And to help me demonstrate body geometry fitting today is one of the top USA cyclists, Tony. I'm not going to demonstrate every bit of the flexibility test we do, but one important thing is we want to take a look at both the shape of the cyclist's back, particularly the lower back, and then we want to see how flexible his hands and strings are. So I'll ask him to put his hands on his hips and bend at the waist until he's roughly parallel to the floor. Okay, so now we see he's got a really nice flat back, a little down curvature here. We're going to pay very close attention to the lower back, the sacrum, when he's on the bike. Because if that's not lined up with the upper back, then he's not using his glute muscles effectively, and those are the strongest muscle in the body. And from here, I'll ask him to let his arms hang and let his neck hang, and then I'll ask him to go down as low as he can without bending the knees. Okay, so here we see a cyclist, which shouldn't be surprising, pro cyclist Tony Cruz, who's incredibly flexible. So we're probably not going to be limited um, in terms of his hamstring flexibility to how low his handlebars will be. There might be other factors that affect that, but the hamstrings are not going to be a factor. Now I've asked Tony to kneel on the bench here, and we got a general shape of the bottom of his feet from the footbed board, but I want to look at something that's also very important, and it's called forefoot varus, or forefoot tilt. Now, by holding a level across the ball of Tony's foot, we can see that from the toe, from the back to the ball of the foot, that his feet tilt toward the outside. A little bit differently. The left one, we would call that a significant amount, and the right one, we'd call a moderate amount. Now this is important because what we are asking a cyclist to do on a bike is basically just move his legs up and down like pistons. Yeah, they go forward and backward a little bit, but essentially we're looking for a piston. Okay, so any gap in the foot that's not supported is, going, is creating a space that the more weight that you put on it, the more that's going to compress. So if your foot compresses in the shoe, it, your, your foot can't really move because it's locked into a pedal but your knee can move, and often that's what we're gonna see. 90% of the population has this forefoot varus, it's very common, and it's one of the most um, commonly misunderstood and undercorrected things on a bike. And we'll see when we get to the 3D, the front camera, how that's gonna to affect Tony's cycling. Okay, now what we're doing now is we're having Tony sit on a piece of memory foam, and it's gonna measure the width of his sit bones if we take a look at this model of the male pelvic structure, we see that here's the points of the bones we're talking about. This is where we want the cyclist to support his weight, there and only there. We don't want anything pushing up in the soft tissue um, because that's not good for your health and also it doesn't give you a stable platform for cycling. But we have to know the width of the sit bone so we know if we've got the appropriate saddle on it. If your sit bones are wide and you are on a narrow saddle, you're going to slide from side to side or you're constantly looking for a neutral place to sit. If your sit bones are narrow and you're on too wide of a saddle, then you're going to be stretching your hamstrings and your IT bands up the sides of that saddle and lead to cramping and lead to very serious problems with the IT band. Okay, so now I'm measuring the width of Tony's sit bones and finding the low spot. Okay, so Tony's got um, basically about 125 millimeters between the sit bones. That's in the average range. So we should be looking for a saddle that's just slightly wider than that, so that the sit bones are centered in each side pad of the rear of the saddle. I'd like to go into a little further how the, the sit bone width and the saddle affects a cyclist's fit. So here, we're, this is a pelvic structure. The bones, the sit bones here are approximately 100 or 110 millimeters apart, so it's a fairly narrow one. So if we sit on this saddle, then we can see that the wings of the saddle towards the back are supporting the sit bones, um, and it's, it's a fairly flat level surface. We can also see that the rest of the saddle is not pushing up into the soft tissue. We can also project that if this saddle goes in an arrow position, that we still have supported above the saddle and no squashing of the soft tissue. So a neutral platform. Now let's take a look at this other saddle here. 
this is a wider saddle, number one. Number two is the saddle slopes off dramatically from either side. So if we're on here, first of all, your tendency is going to be to slide from side to side as you pedal because you do not have a neutral surface. There's not a flat surface to support the sit bones. Um, also, because the rear is not raised, as you go arrow, there's more chance that your soft tissue is going to get crushed. Okay, now I'm going to have Tony do a, a, an exercise we call the one-third knee bend. So I'm going to have him raise his right leg behind him, and then he's going to do a, a squat, a one-third knee bend on the left, and hold it for a few seconds. Okay, good. Come up. Now switch legs. Put the leg, left leg behind you. One-third knee bend. Okay, stand up. Now what did we just see? Okay, so we saw some instability there. Most people initially think this has to do with balance. It actually has nothing at all to do with balance. What it has to do with is how well does one foot support your weight when the other foot's not a factor? And how does that relate to cycling? Well, we're first pushing down with our left foot and the right foot is neutral. And we're pushing down with our right foot and the left foot is neutral. So if I can't get him to stand with stability on one foot, that he's not going to be able to pedal with stability. I'm going to have to pay attention to how we neutralize his shoes to allow him to do that. What we're going to do is we're going to do a, a leg length assessment on Tony. So I want to make sure that his legs are the same length, or if not, I want to know by how much, and I want to know which part of the leg is different lengths. So what I'm going to do is I've, I've asked Tony to relax all the muscles below his waist. I'm going to pull his feet out slowly and a little bit hard. So I get some traction going there, and I'm going to see where his ankles line up. Okay, so what we see here is on his left leg is about a half centimeter longer than the right leg. Not a huge amount, but could be significant, okay? So now to make sure that that doesn't have to do with just a pelvic rotation, I'm going to ask Tony to sit up while I'm holding his feet. He can use his hands if necessary. Go ahead and sit up. Okay, now if it was a pelvic tilt that was causing the problem, the, the uh, ankle bones would have aligned, but the ankle bones are still misaligned, so we know we actually have a true leg length discrepancy. Okay, lie back down, please. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to push your knees up to the original position, and I'm very carefully line up his feet so the ankle bones are together. And now what I do is I'm going to look at this side and this side. So if his tibia bones are different lengths, then one leg's going to be higher at the knee than the other. And if his femurs are different lengths, then there's going to be a discrepancy here. Well, this is interesting because we see, actually, he's got both. So in his left leg, he's got a slightly longer femur because this side's higher than this. And if we look down from this side, we see his knee protrudes a little bit more on the left side and the right. Uh, that one's less significant than the tibia, but, but it's a factor. Now we have some very important information that we can use when we see Tony on the bike, because we're probably going to see some effects of this leg length discrepancy when we make our careful measurements. And if we see it, we know what causes it, and we know what the possible cures are. Now it is also possible that once he gets on the bike, we're not going to see any effect of this leg length discrepancy, in which case we're not going to bother, because if it doesn't manifest itself on the bike, then it doesn't need correction.